Hi, I'm Peter Hart. Welcome to FAIR TV. Let's look at some of what was in the news this week. As if the Syria war wasn't horrible enough, a stream of recent coverage tells us things are about to get much worse. The Syrian government could be getting ready to use chemical weapons. What we are hearing, in certain respects, is reminiscent of the last time an Arab dictator's weapons of mass destruction were treated as a looming threat. Just like with Iraq, anonymous U.S. officials are speaking to certain reporters, particularly those at the New York Times, about satellite imagery that they say shows suspicious activity at certain military sites. That was what the New York Times told us on December 2nd. By December 4th, the Times was reporting on Barack Obama's response to those anonymous claims, his warning that Syria should not cross this red line. To the Times, this was effectively confirming earlier reports of activity at chemical weapons sites. Now, that's a strange standard for confirmation, but the TV networks took things much further. On NBC... And U.S. officials tell us that the Syrian military is poised tonight to use chemical weapons against its own people, and all it would take is the final order from Syrian President Assad. And also on CBS Evening News... This is a commercial satellite photo of a Syrian chemical weapons base. U.S. monitoring of roughly two dozen bases like this indicates the Assad regime has begun preparing its chemical weapons for use. Orders have been issued to bring together chemical ingredients which are normally stored separately for safety, but when combined form the deadly nerve agent sarin. Of course it is entirely possible that Syria could use chemical weapons. But when anonymous U.S. government officials are making these kinds of claims, it should be a time for skepticism and scrutiny. That is, if anything was learned from the disaster of the Iraq War. Well, according to media mythology on the dread fiscal cliff, we're facing imminent danger requiring deep cuts to spending, closing tax loopholes, and increasing government revenue. One way to do the latter is usually missing from the conversation, though a small tax on financial transactions, otherwise known as a speculation tax or a Robin Hood tax. Proponents say it could bring in as much as $300 billion every year, and it could also serve as a check on some of the riskier forms of high-frequency, high-volume trading. Well, that sounds good, right? Apparently not. The Robin Hood tax hardly plays a role at all in media discussions about revenue solutions. One exception was a Washington Post op-ed on December 2nd by activist Ralph Nader, who wrote that, quote, both sides are unwilling to consider a minuscule tax on financial transactions that could be a major source of income, close quote. Now, perhaps taking its cues from both political camps, the nation's press is also ignoring the idea. But this hasn't always been the case. Several major newspapers, like the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and USA Today, have voiced editorial support for this tax in the past. The speculation tax is understandably unpopular among the fix-the-debt CEOs who have become central to discussions of the budget, and the people who incidentally bankroll political careers. So it's understandable that politicians don't want to talk about this idea. What's the media's excuse, though? And finally, we are accustomed to think of media owners exerting their influence by keeping stories they dislike out of the news. But another perk of owning a media outlet is that you can put stories in the news that just so happen to promote your own interests and projects. It was that, and not any journalistic decision making, that led Good Morning America to provide viewers with a very special sneak peek at a new park at Disney World on December 6th. Looks fantastic. Imagine being invited to a fairy tale. Is it quaint to think that somewhere between the Be Our Guest restaurant and Ariel's Grotto, someone should mention that Disney is ABC's corporate parent? ABC handled that with a brief on-screen disclosure of that fact. By the end of the segment, you learned that this was only part one, and the part two follow-up um, report would air the next day. You might need to remind yourself that Good Morning America is technically part of ABC's news department. That fact doesn't seem to require that what they air be news. I'm Peter Hart. Thanks for tuning in to FAIR TV.